everybody. Let's go ahead and get ourselves live here. Looks like I am finally live. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the live stream. And today I wanted to talk about VATs or value added tax. And this has been a pretty frequent subject that a lot of people have asked about. And um, in a nutshell, the value add is what one of the candidates is talking about. And I don't really talk about politics a lot on this channel or, you know, the U.S. debt, which is in the background right now. But I do think that understanding some of the basic terminology when we talk about macroeconomics um, and also microeconomics, I think that value added tax is something that's definitely becoming in the conversation. It's coming into the conversation this year, and uh, I love it. I love that it's coming into the conversation because it's fun for me to talk about, <laughs> and, and I like talking about that. So when, when you initially hear that, uh, you think of like, you know, tub of lard or whatever you may think of, but basically per transaction, if value is coming from the consumption of a good, you, you can apply a VAT to it. And Europe uh, has had some pretty hefty VATs for, for as long as I can remember when I studied in school, uh, everything about it. And I really think that uh, there are a couple proposals that uh, are being put forward about VATs because the way that the system is structured right now is that you, know, you have income and then you have your business. Is that if, if you are a wealthy person, you have a business and you have your income. The vast majority of people will uh, not declare a, as much income as possible. So if the average person is you know, making, let's say, $50,000 a year, and that's coming through a paycheck of some kind or a 1099 or W-2 employment, they are going to pay the majority of our taxes uh, for as, as the United States. Uh, that's just how it's always been. But now when you have the uber wealthy, you know, people, not to point fingers, but they are, they have businesses and I've done this myself. I know a lot of people that have done this and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a system, like an old archaic system that has plenty of loopholes in it. And I think that an important thing to think about is that if, if you have a system and you know how to not necessarily game that system, but you know how to operate within that system, there, uh, there's no harm to you done. I mean, there's, there's no, there's nothing illegal about moving money through a business and paying yourself through that if you so choose to. So you have your, your business and you have your income. The average person just has their, their fixed, their income that they're making every year. Uh, you know, maybe they get a bonus and whatnot. But when you have a, an income and a business and you do your taxes, What's going to happen is if you declare less income and you declare, you know, you pay your corporation taxes or whatever it may be, whatever state you're in, you're going to see that um, the less income that you make, the less taxes that you pay. So if you have a business that's paying you, but yet you're writing everything off through the business and the business is purchasing items for you, then it makes sense to, to continue using the business to purchase things. And a prime example of this is Amazon. So when people slash politicians slash just angry people in general, um, we'll call the, the have-nots, pointing at the, the haves, what, what's going to happen is, you know, everybody says like, hey, Bezos, you're evil. You have, uh, you have too much money. You're a billionaire. Uh, and this is a, a Something that comes across pretty regularly on my radar, people talk about it, asking me questions about what I think about Amazon. And I do think that uh, when, when it comes to Bezos creating Amazon, um, I think that the world is different 
because he created Amazon. Do I think that he has created that much value for the world? Yes. Um, the fact that I could order something right now and it delivers the same day to my doorstep instead of going to the, the corner store, that's monumental. And he's extrapolating tons of value from it. Um, and rightfully so. He, if you change the world, you should be um, rewarded. And the way that capitalism works is if you provide value to the marketplace, you get value in return in the form of money. So he, he definitely has done that <laughs> at, at scale. So when I talk about him, he has a business. The vast, vast majority of his net wealth, what worth is in Amazon stock. People don't seem to, to realize that. Even people that are DMing me daily asking me questions about Amazon, uh, Bezos and these, these billionaires are smart enough to know not to have some sort of taxable event where they cash out all their stock and, and pay a ton of taxes, hundreds of millions in taxes. They, are, uh, they have people that work with them, tax strategists, entirely focused on that. So I'm not a tax strategist by any means, not a professional, not financial advisor or anything like that. I just studied a lot of economics, studied VATs. Um, and, and macroeconomics for four, four years in, in university. So when I see this weird shift of people saying like, hey, this, this guy's a billionaire. Why, why should he have billions of dollars? And A, he provided monumental value to the marketplace, so he's being rewarded in uh, the form of currency. And B is that he is paying for things using his business and his net worth is in stock in his business. So when we talk about taxing him, if he's making zero dollars in tax, how do you tax that? How do you tax someone that's declaring zero dollars in income uh, over you know, and they're making billions of dollars via their stock and their shares in their company and their business? So it's a, it's a common misconception. A lot of people think that for some reason these billionaires have uh, like liquid billions in the bank, but the, the majority of them, they do have the, their, their shares. They have shares in their business and they're very strategic as to how much income they declare. So much so that there's even a club, a $1 club where CEOs and billionaires only pay themselves $1 per year. How do you tax $1 per year? You may be thinking. <laughs> and the answer is you tax it through the business, not in the form of corporate taxes, but through value add taxes. Because when a consumer is consuming your goods in the marketplace, they are, you know, they're probably paying most of the tax. You know, with Amazon, not really much sales tax going on there. And I think that with value-added tax, that's to the company. And if you're providing a vast amount of value, for example, with Amazon, you should be paying per transaction. And this is something that uh, I'm a little surprised not many people have brought up uh, other than uh, the guy who I talked about last time, Andrew Yang. I I've talked about him a couple of times and his UBI concepts and things like that. But he was an economist before he was a lawyer for five months. And the idea of value tax, value added tax, for Amazon specifically to pay for things, uh, to specifically pay for his, his UBI proposal, which is a whole other subject for a, a, different, a different video, um, I do think that there's a really, there's something to be said about just value added tax and that no one's talking about it. No, no one seems to be talking about it. And I'm not sure if that's because um, other people don't really know what it means having a VAT, if they're not familiar with how Europe does their VAT, or if it's, um, yeah, not, not really sure why nobody's really talking about that. So when we talk about with Amazon, that's pretty clean cut can understand how it would be every transaction if I order you know this
this microphone from Amazon, and it comes. I can, um, you know, pay. Or Amazon pays a VAT, value add, because I gain value as a consumer of consumption. I'm consuming this uh, product from their business. They pay tax on that. I'm providing value to citizens. So, on top of Amazon, there are other things that can be applied to this concept. And I think that one of the primary ones, in addition to Amazon, is going to be something like an Uber or a Lyft or ride sharing or uh, things that operate on the internet or on an application that not necessarily are physical, you know, brick and mortar businesses. So with Uber, for example, uh, you know, every mile that's driven, a driver's paid a percentage. Lyft and Uber are paid a percentage, a pretty hefty one. And I think that there should be a VAT on those types of transactions that take place. When an, when I take an Uber to the airport, when I take an Uber out to dinner, when I take it out to, you know, let's say go shopping, don't do much of that, but if, if, I, if I wanted to do that, there's a... Uh, a mindset that needs to be in place that the employer or the business needs to pay for the amount of value that it contributes to a society. And this is kind of a, it's, it's a bridge between a theory and actual practice in economics because Europe has been doing a pretty hefty VATS for years. So I was curious if Uber was paying VATS in Europe. So I did a little digging and um, I found that there wasn't much information. Uh, and I found that they weren't <laughs> paying value added tax, at least from what I could find. Uh, and they are trying to, like, people are effectively trying to tax Uber and Lyft in all these different ways. But I do think that the best and most effective way that makes sense for everyone is using some sort of um, value-added tax. And uh, I pulled up a little document here from pewtrust.org that says that uh, by simply imposing ordinary taxes on the ride-hailing industry, the Institute estimates state and local governments could raise $300 million in revenue per year. So far, barely more than a handful of states, including Maryland, Massachusetts, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina, have subjected ride-hailing services to existing sales taxes and imposed extra taxes or fees on them. Pennsylvania, for, for instance, assesses a 1.4% tax on all rides under a new law approved in November. New York's budget passed just last week. This was from... When did you come out? Oh wow! So this was this is way outdated. This is from 2017. So we got to find some more updated information here. Can't be looking at things from two years ago, especially when it comes to this. All right. Uh, the Massachusetts law imposes 20 cent per ride fee on app-based ride services, with five cents of that going to upgrade ordinary taxis. 10 cents going to local governments and 5 cents going to state transportation fund. Wow. So out of a, in, in Massachusetts, out of a 20 cent per ride uh, fee or tax added to them, 5 cents, I'm going to repeat this because it's crazy, <laughs> 5 cents going to or upgrade their competitors, which are ordinary taxis, 10 cents, so 50% is going to local governments, and 5 cents are going to the state transportation fund. So I can see the state transportation fund, I can see local governments, but the upgrading ordinary taxis seems like a punch to the gut. That may be out of date, so definitely take that with a, a grain of salt. Uh, the fees can add up, as Lyft and Uber have already combined 2.5 million rides a month in the state. This was in 2017. So we need, um, let's see here, there we go. 
this one is another one that's still somewhat out of date, but this is pretty relevant. How Uber avoids VATs. And this is from Electronics Weekly, a little bit of a shaky service there. Uh, Uber has 40,000 UK drivers. Okay, so this is in the in Europe and how they are going to um, move away from the VAT. Has 40,000 UK drivers and estimates the cost to of paying VAT would be 1,000 per driver, 1,000 pounds per driver per year. So like $1,500 per year. Um, the UK market is important to Uber because it accounts for a third of all Uber's European revenues. Let's see. Looks like there's something from the Financial Times in here. I'm going to jump onto that. Uh, Uber faces legal challenge on paying VAT. Let's see what we got. Uh, all right. So, as you can, I mean, as you can hear, because I'm just pulling these up in the background to give a little bit more context. Um, Basically, the VAT is, is a big steamroll proposition for these businesses. And it's powerful for citizens to impose it on businesses. And it's best for the ability for businesses to help contribute to where they operate. And for example, with Uber trying to weasel their way out of VATs in the UK and not paying virtually any tax in the US and Amazon paying zero, Lyft, I'm not sure what their tax position is. I do know 11 cents out of every transaction goes to AWS, which is <laughs> almost a whole nother story. But I, I do just really quickly want to say that, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily have political opinions on like one person that I, I dislike or I do like. But what I will say is when you bring up problems and you talk about problems with an actual solution, instead of just saying, I'm going to do it, um, that is, you know, it's, it's idea versus execution. And I think that a lot of what's existed in my lifetime, my wife's lifetime, probably your lifetime if you're watching this, is just a lot of uh, like hollow promises. And... I don't think that that's going to exist much longer because in reality, we, we're going to stop trusting just other humans um, to, to, to execute on their what they say they're going to do. Like there's going to be an accountability system and it's, it's definitely a lot of people currently in the political space aren't going to fit into that system very well. And if you're going to present problems, you need to actually present a way to solve it, like backing into it. Similar to how Google interviews people, you need to at least be able to to back into something and, and talk out loud as you back into it. Like just, you know, that coffee is really good. I made that coffee this morning using 170 degree water, used really good beans from a coffee shop nearby, backed into, you know, the, the temperature of the water, backed into the good beans, backed into the Chemex that I used to make it, not a coffee maker. Using your mind to, to explain how you're going to do something is how it, it needs to be. And there's going to be something that happens, I'm sure, in the near future where the accountability is going to have to go through the roof in order to actually like win something like an election. So when I see solutions being put out like a VAT, uh, I get attracted to that. Um, I definitely gravitate towards that because I know that it's worked for other countries. And in order to operate in those countries as a business, you need to abide by those rules. And I know that not having one has probably produced more innovation. But at a certain point, with Amazon shutting down malls and you know, putting the, the shaky ground under one of the most popular jobs in the U.S., which is retail, you need to. You really need to scale back that um, that front running innovation on that specific company. There's plenty of other things that need to be loosened in regulation, and then there's other things that need to be tightened in regulation. And I think that when it comes to destruction and disrupting a bunch of um, you know current GDP, like people generating their income and paying taxes, 
if that's going to get wiped out by one or two operators or businesses, there needs to be a, a tightening um, a tightening on that, at least to, to innovate for them, giving them a framework that says, hey, here are the guidelines that you need to operate within. Show us how you're going to do it and, and come back to us. And at least having some sort of a framework will help. Um, and I think that solutions are really the only way to do that. So I know I, I mentioned Andrew Yang in the title mainly because he's the only one that I've heard and I'm, you know, about VATS, and I'm not just going to talk about politics all the time, but it's just such a good topic. I, I enjoy the topic. I respect the topic. I respect that other countries are crushing it, doing this exact tax on businesses. And as I said before, income and your business, if you are making zero in income and you're making, you know, $5 million in your business and writing everything off and, and you know, working your magic, hiring a tax strategist, there is a, a disconnect there that means that there needs to be more, more focus on these businesses when people are paying zero in tax and they're making $5 million and not paying any tax. There needs to be a, a focus on that. And this is more of like a greater good thing. I own a business. I, uh, you know, I, I do everything by the book. I have great accountants that I work with, and I'm sure a lot of you guys watching this may have a business as well that you do the same thing with. I just, uh, I recommend that everybody pays pays their own way and equal equal opportunity. And I think that uh, with equal opportunity, with businesses, Amazon needs to pay their own way. Everybody needs to pay their own um, and obviously, there's going to be people that break the system in order to fix it. Like in order to break something, you got to, or in order to fix something, you, it has to break first. Usually, um, you can't really just iterate uh, constantly on an old framework that just has legacy code in it over and over and over and over again, to the point where it just is a, an archaic, unfunctional system. So um, yeah, that's kind of my my overview of VATS today at least, and I'm excited to see it come to the, the conversation. I mean, you have so many valuable things that can come of it. Um, you just have so much. And I, I think that it, it's great to see economic concepts like this coming up. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, universal basic income or anything like that today, because I think that still has a ways to go as far as it making a lot of sense for a country because um, you don't want to bankrupt a country right out of the, you know, if you're, yeah, you could bankrupt the country. And, and, and it's not like a, a um, something that would happen right away. It would be a slow bleed. So I think that there is a, that's another topic that we can talk about. You guys, I know a lot of you guys are going to DM me about it and ask me to talk about it. But for today, it was just about the VATs and the power of them and the benefits to them for both citizens and businesses. So that's it for this episode. Um, I hope you guys like it. If you did, there's going to be a link in the description below for uh, the podcast that's coming out called Sound Money. And I'm going to be interviewing some complete, amazing founders, CEOs, project managers, marketers on businesses using technology, new technology specifically, lots of different technology that people are not using that they should be. And I love, I love the idea of lean or hyper lean companies that are leveraging technology in a way that no one else is uh, to make more and more progress. So that's it. If you guys want to subscribe to that podcast, the link to that's going to be in the description below. And I hope you guys enjoyed the VAT segment. I know I enjoyed talking about it. This stuff is really interesting to me. And uh, I think that this is very productive for, uh, for the country and just for the world as a whole having vets around. And that's it. I will see you guys on the next episode.